What's good, big dogs? My name is Adam, new Dynasty content creator here at BDGE. I've been a part of the community since about 2016, 2017. Started watching Nick way back then. And over time, started watching other people that were making content, especially on the game of Dynasty. Was really focused on wanting to improve and advance and get better tactically as a Dynasty strategist. And over time, by consuming so much content, I decided, you know what, why don't I start making some content to my own? And Mike and I eventually formed South Harmon, which... Uh, it was about two and a half years ago now and continuing to evolve there and now have an opportunity to come put you guys on some game and give some dynasty strategy tips that I have and inform the process that I have today to you. And that full circle thing from going to the person that I started watching content with and now having a chance to create content for you. Pretty cool for me. You may not know much about me. That's a little bit of the backstory. Some people know me as the ATM. And we're about to go make some money moves. But before we do that, see a lot of people at BDG, I've seen, you know, the start and where we are today. We're getting too far away from tradition. It's time to pay homage. Put some damn respect on the process that started BDGE. So I need you to stand up. Tuck your shirts in. Stop yelling. Because it's time to eat. All right, so today I'm going to be bringing you the seven worst picks round by round in current startups. I'm going to be using the startup ADP. You saw Andrew uh, give you the first seven best values that he thought in each round. I'm going to be giving you the worst. Guys, I do not want to be leaving that specific round with. Now, in round one, you're not likely to screw up your draft per se. All of these are pretty damn good players. But if I had to pick one that I really don't want to leave with or I feel like isn't a value at the current range, it's going to be Justin Herbert. Now, they just got a brand new coach and Coach Harbaugh coming over from Michigan. And there's this idea that he's this quarterback whisperer. Going back to the days of Andrew Luck, he's someone that can get the best out of his quarterbacks. That isn't the big piece, though. Um, him coming in and Staley going... Not necessarily the biggest of reasons, although I am a little skeptical that he's going to be a big upgrade for Herbert. For me, one of the reasons I'm really concerned about Herbert in this round relative to the other guys I could be taking, if you go over to spotrack.com, you can get a lot of information on the salary cap and players' specific contracts. The Chargers are in some very big cap hell, and they currently are the fourth team as far as cap availability. They're currently in the red, minus 44 million. They have a lot of cap situation to figure out. Now, the cap is a myth you may have heard of, and there's a lot of ways they can get around this. But the reason it's important, because they have so much money to shift and figure out how they're going to get under the cap, they have two guys in Mike Williams and Keenan Allen that are known as their top weapons that are both aging and both currently cap casualties. So Keenan Allen is going to be going on 32 this year. At that age, that in and of itself is where we know is sometimes the age cliff can happen, the age apex where production and the quality of their play starts to go down. I mean, even if we assume that Keenan Allen's still going to ball out at this really high rate, they have a chance to get out of this contract with a minimal cap hit um, given all the cap casualties they have. So with him being a cap casualty and Mike Williams also being a cap casualty, they can opt out of these contracts this offseason before the pre-cut date of June 1st. Two of his top weapons that are old and may be gone. Last year, they drafted Quentin Johnson, who has been a colossal bust. He's a face planner so far. The rest of their weapons, very, very sketchy. They have a top 10 pick this year. Kind of a, the assumption is they're going to either take like Brock Bowers or another weapon, Aroma Dunze, Malik Neighbors, whoever may be there at that number five pick. But that's one rookie. They're probably not likely to have both of these guys back given their cap situation. So the uncertainty of his weapons there. Plus, we have a four-year sample size of who Justin Herbert is as a passer, as a player in the NFL at the quarterback position. I mean, he came in in his rookie year. You may, you may remember the punctured lung situation with Tyrod Taylor. Kind of took the league by storm that year. Looked great. Uh, has a cannon of an arm. He has a lot of the traits you'd want in a quarterback. He kind of followed that up in 2021, having an unbelievable season. On a points-per-game basis, and number two player at the quarterback position in points per game, this guy looked like a stud, everything we wanted to see. But if you take a closer look, a deeper dive into his numbers in the 2021 season, why he was so high in points per game, he threw for over 5,000 yards passing, and he also had 38 passing touchdowns. Now, if those 5,000 yards and 38 touchdowns, those raw numbers don't really mean anything to you, let me give you a little clarity, some context to this. In the history of the NFL, the entire time, there's been 15 occurrences of someone throwing 5,000 yards as a passer. That's already pretty rare. Now, let me give you the names of the players that have done this and how many times they've done it. So you start off, you got Mr. Drew Brees almost penciling in a chance to get near that 5,000 yards. He had five times where he was over 5,000 yards as a passer. Damn near six. He was knocking on the door one season. He had 49 plus 100 yards, just did not make that 5K mark. Then you got Tom Brady. So the GOAT at the quarterback position, only twice in his career, had over 5,000 yards. The young goat, the billy goat, Patrick Mahomes, twice as well. Then you got Peyton Manning, Dan Marino, Big Ben, Matthew Stafford, Justin Herbert, and 
Jameis Winston, while throwing 30 picks, all have one occurrence of a season of over 5,000 yards passing. And the reason I wanted to go through that with you and the occurrences, the GOAT at football, Tom Brady, and the current unbelievable start of his career, Patrick Mahomes, are the only guys that aren't Drew Brees that have multiple occurrences of over 5,000 yards passing. Justin Herbert, just by looking historically, unless we think he's one of the best passers the game has ever seen, is not likely to throw for that many yards, honestly, ever again. Um, And if he does, it's probably going to be one or two more times. You're talking an outlier season for his career. And then you have 38 touchdowns occurring in this season. And 38 passing touchdowns, there's been 31 occurrences of that. Now, while that's not quite as uncommon as the 5,000 yards, 38 touchdowns is an unbelievable season. So you're talking about with NFL historical perspective, him having a great passing touchdown season and an unbelievable passing yard season in the same year to get to that quarterback two range. But then in the 2022 season, Justin Herbert, he was dealing with that rib injury. Uh, he was quarterback 17 on a points per game basis. And then last year was quarterback 10 on a points per game basis. Now, even if you kind of give a injury dismiss to the 2022 season, which I tend to say that was a lot because of the way he played injured, you're looking at two seasons where it looks like that quarterback 10 range is kind of the floor of what we can expect from Justin Herbert. Also as a rusher, he adds a nice little floor, right? He can scramble, he's athletic, he can make plays with his legs, but typically because he's such a good passer, he's got that cannon attached to him, he's looking to throw the ball. He's he's scrambling with the idea of making a play with his arm. So while he can run and he will do that, uh, he's looking at probably somewhere in that 150 to 300 yards as a rusher. So look, all in all, Justin Herbert, not a bad player, has a safe floor. He's going to be a good dynasty and fantasy asset. I'm not arguing that he's a bad one. But in this round, I don't love leaving with Justin Herbert in the range that I'd have to take guys that I think have very high ceilings as a quarterback. And I think you could just have other positional players that are going behind Justin Herbert, which give you elite difference maker scoring at their respective position. It's time to start digging into the strategy piece of this. And when we look at round two from a strategy perspective, the one that clearly fits the bill is the worst pick or one I'm not looking to make in the second round is going to be Christian McCaffrey. When you take a guy like Christian McCaffrey, the truth of the matter is while he's a stud and a points per game difference maker, he's only going to be probably appealing to a certain percentage of your league. Now in a brand new startup, maybe not everyone is uh, clearly picking directions. Sometimes teams are going to get very good. They're clearly going for it and there's going to be some teams that are bowing out they need to kind of restructure rebuild their team anybody that's in that rebuild restructure mode or is focusing on the future christian mccaffrey is not going to be fitting what they're trying to do with their team and in essence you're kind of going to be cutting out those people from trade talks for yourself down the road remember you're going to be drafting the startup right now but just because you do that doesn't mean this is the team for the rest of your life the whole idea is to make a bunch of trades to trade as much as possible with your league mates and the people that are drafted around Christian McCaffrey, they're a lot more flexible. Going after him right now is Jameer Gibbs. I personally would take Jameer Gibbs ahead of McCaffrey, but even if you personally wouldn't, Jameer Gibbs, he's young enough. Someone that's you know in a rebuild isn't going to say, nah, I don't want Jameer Gibbs. There's a, It's a lot more likely that you can trade and have the flexibility to trade to all your different league mates with younger assets, especially in the offseason where you don't have to set your lineup until September. All right, so let's go ahead and take a look at some actual trades, what the real-time current market is of Christian McCaffrey if you were to draft and then try to trade him right now. If you go to the lab on the SouthHarmonFF.com page, so the T-H-E dash L-A-B dot SouthHarmonFF.com, Go take a look at the old Sleepier Manager tool, which JCAP has been making some updates to. This is going to give you so many different ways to unlock trades and ideas in your league with real-time Sleepier information. First thing you're going to do, go ahead and insert your Sleepier username. First page you're going to see, this is a players page. It's going to give you a list of all the different shares you have of players. Right now, we're going to be skipping over this. Hit that players tab, and when you hit the players tab, you'll have leagues, league mates, and trades. Hit the trades button. Now, if you go back up and hit the button there that says league mate, league trades, Click that and hit the price check one. This price check is going to give you real-time trades that are actually pulled from Sleeper API. What you're going to do is simply type in the name Christian McCaffrey. So the first one here, uh, one quarterback with one super flex, one tight end and a half tight end premium, right? That's the settings of the league. So this is a super flex league. Jordan Love and Christian McCaffrey is the trade. Now one for one, this one isn't that bad, right? You're basically able to stay in the second round, but still if you're taking Christian McCaffrey based on this ADP in the early part of the second round just to trade back for Jordan Love, which you could have taken at that spot anyway. But that, that's not that bad. Let's get into the next one. A 25 first random 
or Noah Brown? You still interested in taking Chris McCaffrey for that value? I don't think so. How about Najee Harris, Keaton Mitchell in a 24 second? Can I interest you in that at the 204? I would hope not. Christian McCaffrey now for Matthew Stafford, Chase Brown in the 24 first. This pick hasn't been currently updated or decided in the sleeper league, so I guess depending on where that is, maybe. But if this is any type of mid to late first, this is not really what you're looking to do if you get an early second round pick in a startup. Next one, Christian McCaffrey or Josh Downs in a 24 first. 24 first or Roshan Johnson? For your Christian McCaffrey, the 204 in a startup. This one here, straight up for Nico Collins. And I know Nick loves Nico Collins, but <laughs> this is not, this is antithetical to what you're trying to do if you're pressing the button on someone at the 204 to basically trade back two rounds for Nico Collins. A 25 second and the 106 of Christian McCaffrey. Now, all in all, value wise, this isn't probably that bad for a running back, but again, you're trading back a round to pick up a 15th round startup based on ADP where the second's going. Again, suboptimal. Lastly, how about this whole big package, huh? What about Aaron Jones, DeAndre Swift, Jonathan Mingo, the 311 and the 25 first? Just based on ADP, there's no reason that you would ever want to do this from the 204 to go back and take a ninth round, 12th round, 15th round, 20th round, all to get that 25 first, which right now you have to wait a whole year for and you have no idea if it's going to be mid, early, or late. Point of that exercise is to show you that if you draft Christian McCaffrey, you want to go to shop him or trade him, you're very unlikely to get the value out of Christian McCaffrey that you pressed on that 204 pick when you selected him. And even if you're saying, Adam, I'm, I'm drafting Christian McCaffrey, I'm holding him till the season. This is the way I like to think about, especially the early parts of startups. Let's call it the first, second, and third rounds in particular. This, if you're gonna even hold all the way to the season, I look at these more as foundational pieces for your dynasty team. You wanna build the foundation on something that's gonna continue to build value and has the opportunity to stay in that elite range. Christian McCaffrey at his age, if he gets any kind of an injury situation happens in the off season, like Christian McCaffrey has a whole lot more value to lose than he does to gain. So if Christian McCaffrey's smashing in the season like we saw this year, look at where he's going now. I'm not telling you you can't have a guy like Christian McCaffrey on your dynasty teams, and I'm not saying that I wouldn't want to have Christian McCaffrey on my contenders, but I'm not going to do that by taking him in the second round of a startup. If I want to get Christian McCaffrey, the idea is I'm going to form my team with a good foundation of players. And if now I think my team is ready to contend, I'll push in future picks or reassemble what I currently have in value in players and now trade for Christian McCaffrey when I'm much better positioned. Round three is pretty easy for me. And it's going to be Jalen Waddle for the Miami Dolphins. We've seen now three seasons out of Jalen Waddle. Going into year four for him, he is someone that's still getting a ton of value. Keep trade cut has him very high. We're looking at wide receiver 10 here in startups. And this price is absolutely not for me. And if you take a look at his body of work, right, in his rookie season, this guy was a target hog. 140 targets, had over 1,000 yards, looking like a really, really promising start for the career of Jalen Waddle. Now, that team in his rookie season really lacked a lot of, like, big star power. Jalen Waddle was just being force fed. And while that's nice to have 104 catches, all those targets, you would like some more efficiency, right? He kind of lacked in that efficiency department. So going into year two, we want the efficiency to come up. And man, he completely does this in a big way, right? Completely flips it on its head. He becomes the most efficient receiver in the NFL, 18.1 on a per reception basis, still getting 117 targets. And that combined with his rookie season, you're thinking maybe all things are clicking. So while the efficiency increase was great, he had eight touchdowns. That really drove and propelled a lot of this wide receiver seven finish that he had in year two. But when you start to look at a lot of the details, the efficiency started to come back to earth a little bit, still better than year one. The touchdowns also came down, only four this year. And what we're really starting to see with Jalen Waddle is he's the beta, and as long as Tyreek Hill is the alpha in town and still a dog, while he's playing like this, Jalen Waddle is going to be a lot more of a boomer bust receiver. Now, listen, there's nothing wrong with having a boomer bust receiver. The guy still has some very high upside certain weeks. I can wait a little bit and get guys that still have the potential to spike and pop like Jalen Waddle does. If you look at Jalen Waddle last year on a points per game basis, because he did miss three games, you're looking at wide receiver 21. So he's not even a top 20 wide receiver in points per game. Not really any much different production than Jacoby Myers. Come on. I don't, I'm not drafting this dude as a top 10 receiver in dynasty startups in the third round. I'd rather have a guy like Brandon Ayuk, Nico Collins. Honestly, some of the guys in the fifth round, especially at the value drop from over a round, Rasheed Rice, I'd rather have these guys than Jalen Waddle in the third. Third round, you can miss me with that shit. All right, now as we get down in the fourth round, all these names are not clear-cut winners for me. I don't love every single one of the guys going here, but the worst one is clear-cut and easy for me again. It is TJ Hockenstein, tight end for the... Minnesota Vikings. Now look, since coming over from Detroit to Minnesota, dude's been nothing short of a dog. I get it. He's been balling out of control. This year, he led tight ends in fantasy points per game. So you're probably asking, why am I fading TJ Hawkinson at the 411? Stop the cap. 
Really late in the year, TJ Hawkinson tears his ACL in a game where he's going out for vengeance against Detroit. He tears his ACL, and this late in the year, an ACL tear is already going to be cause for concern, uh, getting back and rehabilitating, being 100% right when the season's ready to go. Now, if it was just an ACL injury, I could even probably overlook some of that because he's been so good. But this is a multi-ligament knee injury. He didn't just tear his ACL. Due toward his MCL too. Listen, I ain't no doctor. I ain't trying to give you medical advice, all right? But when it comes to multi-ligament knee injuries, and you have to do reconstructive surgery on these, really bad for football players in the return. Three guys immediately come to mind as far as multi-ligament knee injuries of recent memory. That'd be J.K. Dobbins, Javante Williams, and Chris Godwin. Chris Godwin is going to be the one that we can compare to both as far as timeline and the same ligaments. So he also tore his MCL and ACL, and he did so almost at the exact same timeline two years ago, December 20th, 2021, tears his ACL and MCL. So Godwin has surgery, and in the offseason, all the reports for the most part are pretty positive, saying he's ahead of schedule as far as returning. He's actually on pace to miss the pup, not have to go on the pup list at all, and be on track to play week one. Week one, he plays versus Dallas. About a third of the way into the game, he suffers what we know as an overcompensation injury. So think about it like this. You have a serious knee injury of this type where you have reconstructive surgery. You have a lot of instability in your knee. You're getting used to that, and typically you're not going to trust it very much. Because of that lack of trust, whether it's subconsciously or not, you tend to overcompensate, right? You're not wanting to put too much pressure on that knee, and by doing that, you're adjusting your movements, which causes an overcompensation, and that's where that hamstring injury occurred for Chris Godwin. So he only ends up missing week two and week three after that. He ends up playing the rest of the games from week four on. But what you'll see is there was a lack of efficiency from what we were used to seeing with Chris Godwin, the player. He had a bunch of targets. He had a okay season. But take a look. Let's go over to Keep Trade Cut. When you get to Keep Trade Cut, you'll see you can look at the all-time value for a player. So they'll, they'll show you kind of the six-month range typically. But you can click the all-time button. And I tell you what, when you take a look at this Chris Godwin, you don't even need me to tell you where he started and where it's at. You can just see that downward trend. If this was a stock, you would hate to have that. You would have lost a bunch of money. If you look in 2020, when he was at his peak, Chris Godwin was in the conversation at that point for wide receiver one overall in Dynasty. Going into the end of the 21 season, still right there when he tore his ACL and MCL. After the news had taken place, people could digest it and all that. Still, wide receiver 11 in Dynasty. People very bullish on Chris Godwin. But what you see is his value continues to trend down. So for TJ Hawkinson, right, using this as a blueprint of somebody that suffered a ACL and MCL this late in the year, for me, I'm just staying away. First of all, the tight end position, take a look at warp on South Harmon, southharmonff.com forward slash warp. You can see wins over replacement player. Most leagues, unless it's an extremely heavy tight end premium, I'm not saying you don't want to have a good tight end, but I'm okay if this is the position I'm weak at. So for me, TJ Hawkinson already playing the tight end position, I don't need to have a stud there. But if you do want to chase that, there's so many other tight ends that are going to be healthy right away in the start of the year. I'm perfectly fine not having TJ Hawkinson. And with this type of an injury, it's an easy, easy fade for me. All right, now as we get into the fifth round here, there's a few names that kind of stick out. I don't love everybody in this round. And I hate to admit that this would be the one that I think is the worst pick and the guy I do not want to leave the fifth round with. Because I was so bullish on him, I planted my flag on Kenneth Walker coming out of Michigan State in the 2022 rookie class. But going into year three here, in the fifth round at running back 10, I can't do it at this price point. Kenneth Walker the third is the worst pick, in my opinion, in this fifth round. Not a whole bunch of details as far as specific deep dive strategies as to why, other than the simple thing of this. One, this fifth round is littered with receivers that I would much rather build my team around at this point in the draft. Like straight up, I'd rather have Jordan Addison, DK Metcalf, JSN, Zay Flowers, Rashi Rice, Drake London, all these guys in the fifth round. I'm going to take them straight up ahead of Kenneth Walker. And then the second thing, why do I have to have my running back right now? First of all, there's in the next round, there's three running backs that I feel at the exact same level of comfort. Then also look at all the yellow. I haven't talked a lot about picks yet as far as when I would take them. But this time, I'm absolutely taking the 107, the 108, and the 109 without question ahead of Kenneth Walker. Kenneth Walker at this point through his career, he's shown some promising signs, right? He has a lot of the good traits that you want a running back. But the reality is the thing he's missing, and I'm not going to take at this point a running back that's getting this little pass work, getting less than two catches a game. If I'm going to take a running back in this range, at least the guy next to him, Saquon, while older, catches a ton of passes and can play a high, high percentage of snaps. We've seen quads be a difference maker. Kenneth Walker in the points per game department, as well as this lack of pass catching upside, I'm good, man. Y'all can have Kenneth Walker. Once a stand, now I'm out. 
Let's get into the sixth round, though. Now, when we get to the sixth round, like, I really wanted to take Bryce Young as the worst pick in this sixth round. You know, Gut's going to be editing this video. Don't you dare edit this shit out. And in the sixth round, with Bryce Young being there, I couldn't actually do it, though. As much as I want to come at Gut with this Carolina Panthers struggling, this situation really isn't going to get better, I don't think, in the immediate future. He's probably a value in this range. He's tr he lost a lot of value throughout the year. And he's already down to quarterback 18. So he's not the worst pick in round six. And the worst pick in round six, honestly, tough for me to admit because I have a lot of love for Jaden Reed. Coming out of Michigan State, he has a lot of the traits, I think, to make a special receiver. And we saw a lot of that this year with Jordan Love. Now, in his rookie season, there was a lot to like and take away from Jaden Reed's year. Overall, the theme is going to be efficiency. This is a dude that just balled out and was efficient with all the opportunities he had. If you look at playerprofiler.com, he's fifth in the NFL in fantasy points per target, and he separates really well versus man. First man coverage, he's in the top 12 of receivers, so he's getting open. The other thing is the dude had 10 total touchdowns, so fifth in the NFL as far as touchdowns in his rookie season. He's got a lot of special traits. He could translate to somebody that's very, very good at the NFL level. And Jordan Love looked to him a lot in the red zone. It wasn't like it's just crazy fluky touchdowns as far as the volume goes. He got a lot of volume in the red zone. Jordan Love's looking at Jaden Reed in the red zone. So we like seeing all that stuff. Now here's the bad news though. Imagine being that good and that efficient, right? This, this whole offense was very young at the receiver position. A lot of people fighting for the same spots. So imagine being that good, the coaching staff seeing that week in and week out, especially later in the year as he was continuing to improve, but the snap share doesn't change. And actually, towards the end of the year, he's playing on less snaps. Over 80 receivers in the NFL played more snaps this year than Jaden Reed did. So why is this? Why is Jaden Reed not playing on a higher percentage of snaps? So let's dig into this a little bit. And typically, one of the things that causes for concern with this part-time player is you'll see that they get a lot of slot percentage snaps. And he's number 16 in the NFL when it comes to slot snaps. The reason this is something to pay attention to is if you're playing primarily in the slot, but when you go to the two receiver sets and you've got to go outside, you're not playing in that role, that's kind of the red flag. Now, think about this too. The Packers drafted both Tucker Craft and Luke Musgrave in this draft both of which throughout times of the year had some success. So if they decide to use some heavy packages and they don't have a slot receiver out there, Jaden Reed may be the odd man out, not on the field. Also consider, supposedly going to be a breakout guy this year, Christian Watson. <clears throat> I told you not to draft him, but neither here nor there. Christian Watson dealt with a lot of injuries this year. And what you see is when Christian Watson was healthy, he was playing a very, very high percentage of snaps. And a decent amount of Jaden Reed's really high success came with Christian Watson off the field. So if you believe Christian Watson is going to return to full health and be one of the centerpieces for this Packers offense, we've seen guys like Dontavian Wicks and Bo Melton have success at times. Is there a chance that Jaden Reed really isn't going to carve out more of a role? That's kind of the concern here. Can he make the transition and earn the trust from this coaching staff to become a full-time player? That's really the biggest key. When you look at the snap percentage right now that he's playing, I mean, he's literally sandwiched in between Rashad Bateman, Chris Moore, Rashid Shaheed, and Curtis Samuel. None of which anyone's very, very excited about in Dynasty or in Fantasy in general anymore. And if he's going to continue to stay penciled into a role of, you know, 60% of snaps, 65 even, he's not going to have the volume to be able to sustain this type of efficiency year in and year out. 10 touchdowns on this amount of snaps, all this type of high efficiency, that's not really what you want to chase if the volume doesn't go with it. Now, to give you the upside, I mean, if you see the if you see the scenario where Jaden Reed can overcome this, I think the perfect picture is another rookie this year to look at, and that's Rasheed Rice from the Kansas City Chiefs. And when you think about it, one of the bigger storylines this year was that, you know, Patrick Mahomes having so much inconsistency from this receiver room, needing so much help, uh, the great player Mahomes is, drops and problems with all the different receivers from Kadarius Toney, Marcus Valdez-Scantling, list goes on and on. But if you look at Rasheed Rice relative to the rest of the receivers for the Chiefs, you'll start to see over the course of the season, he started to ramp up this snap percentage. And by like week 12, 14 especially, he had turned into a completely different animal and weapon for Patrick Mahomes. He's a dog out there and he's earning all those snaps. So while they're different players, they're not exactly the same, both six foot, about 200 pounds, they both, I think, have upside and tremendous ability at the NFL level. So Jaden Reed definitely has, I think, some of the traits and ability, the explosiveness to make that jump if he gets the opportunity to be more of an every down player. But right now in this draft, when I'm drafting the startups, I can't say for certain that that range of outcomes is definitely going to be what takes place. And 
while that is there and the upside's there, I definitely have some Jaden Reed shares. I'm really not loving this price in the sixth round. So I'm going to go ahead and pass on Jaden Reed in this round as the worst pick, given all the options on the board. And let's get into the last seventh player, the worst pick in round seven. And that's going to be Javante Williams running back out of the Denver Broncos. All right, so look, here's the thing with Javante Williams. I'll admit, I was very in on Javante Williams after his rookie season, the hype really leading into the 2022 year, right? Javante Williams in the game versus the Kansas City Chiefs, when finally given the opportunity, when Melvin Gordon missed time and with this opportunity, the boys shined in a big way on a national televised game. He had nine targets, six catches, had a touchdown, over 100 yards on the ground, looking very explosive, bruising style back, but also had footwork and could catch the ball. So you're looking at a guy that had this three down skill set that was really tantalizing. So going into this sophomore year, 2022, I'll be honest, I was high on him. Russell Wilson came over and a lot of people still thought that Russ could cook back then. Well, it turns out that we saw what happened with Nathaniel Hackett and Russ is trending downward. And also, now just think about this. Russell Wilson's not even probably going to be a part of the team. They had a chance to make the playoffs, shut him down with two weeks left in the season. But for Javante Williams in that second year, he was earning targets in that first game, but we talked about earlier, multi-ligament knee injury. And after missing that whole 2022 season, Javante coming into this year, coming off that multi-ligament knee injury, he actually played almost the whole year. He missed one game, but one, this three down skill set and opportunity wasn't really there. He was kind of a 50% player. Uh, he was a top you know, 10 running back, I think three or four weeks this year. I'm looking for more than that here in the seventh round if I'm going to take this guy at running back 15, running back 16. Denver's moving on from Russell Wilson. They are not currently in a position to go draft one of the three uh, quarterbacks that everyone feels really good about in this class. So you have uncertainty at the quarterback, uncertainty overall what the offense is going to look like. His role in this team is not certain, and his role moving forward after this year isn't certain. Like it, Overall, it's just way too much uncertainty and way too much projecting. When you look at the three years Javante's played, if you just even take injuries out of the consideration as far as the total like stat counting, right, raw numbers, go to points per game. This is a guy with three years of work, has not even been a top 24 running back. Just do yourself a favor. Don't take Javante in the seventh round. There's guys in the eighth and honestly even in the ninth that I'd much rather have than Javante Williams. So that's it. That's all I got. That's the seven worst picks in startup ADP currently, according to myself. One for each round. Let me know what you thought. Let me know what you thought of the player analysis, of the takes, of the strategy. Can I get a like? Can I get a comment? Can I get a subscribe? Go hit that subscribe button. Subscribe to the channel. We'll see you next week, Friday, on BDGE Dynasty. We're out of this thing. Yeah!